What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Representing the Resin. My name is Jameson Balborn, and today we are joined by Chase Organitron. Chase, thank you so much for taking the time, bro. Appreciate you having me here, brother. This is great. Absolutely, man. Where are you joining us from? Uh, West Michigan. No, no. So you and I connected. We actually had the pleasure of sitting at the ladies' table at Ego Clash. Um, that was that was an honor in itself. And yeah. I just really vibe with you. We we went dab for dab, and uh, it was it was just really cool. And it was definitely you know, as an East Coast hash maker, I don't feel like those makers have as much of a stage or spotlight as as makers on the West Coast. And you know, it's definitely important to me to to highlight those individuals because I know you know you guys are just as passionate and putting in the work. So before we get into ego your experience there and you know your your years in the industry we always like to start out um with you know your come up so tell us a little bit about where you're from where you grew up what life was like back then shit man um west michigan born and raised um and uh you know i, I started young dude I'll, I'll be head up like i started smoking cannabis way too young nine years old um and uh just you know not in the best environment um didn't have a lot of checks and balances as a kid and uh i kind of got into it uh at a time when you know my father was struggling with uh, addiction issues he unfortunately was um, a test patient for oxycontin and um a lot of people know that name and know it's horrible shit. so um i kind of found myself into it and uh being like a younger quiet kid like it kind of, it tamed me. It kept me back. It kept me, uh, it kind of kept me out of trouble, like smoking herb did, um, and helped me deal with a lot of shit. Was it, and, uh, was it immediate? Like when you, when your first interaction with it, was it something that you were drawn to or did it take some time? So, to... uh, I was with my brother and his friends. Um, I think my, my two, my brother is two years older than me. Uh, so he would have been 11 and, uh, we were downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan here, uh, on an old parking garage with a, a buddy of ours and uh, he fired up a joint and we smoked it. And I rode a fucking skateboard down this parking ramp and the chatter bumps and shit. By the time I got to the bottom row, my fucking legs were numb. And like, I was like, Oh my God, this is it. This is the shit. Like a fucking sold. And uh, we just proceeded to, you know, kind of pursue like smoking and, uh, skateboarding and just, uh, you know, I was being a kid, but at that point I had kind of had found cannabis and it's placed it into, you know, my activities. And by the time I was 12, I was a daily user and, uh, wow. um, with, but with a respect, you know, um, and then at 13, uh, you know, my father knowing, you know, what he had been involved in and knowing that he didn't want me to go down the same path as him ever, um, actually taught me cultivation, brought me out. We, uh, the farm that I actually am on now that I just took over this last year is our family farm. And, uh, he took me out back. We had like 60 acres then. And, uh, we found a spot and he taught me how to grow. And, um, I grew, you know, outdoor for years. Um, and just for myself, just, to uh, keep the head and, and that was kind of it. And, uh, it got me in trouble. Um, for sure. You know, freshman fucking year going into high school with a bag of gas in your pocket. And, uh, by the time I was 18, I had already three misdemeanor possession charges. So, um, so, sorry to interrupt chase, but like uh, your father teaching you at such a young age would, would lead me to believe he had a deep connection with the plant himself. Yes. 100%. Um, so what was that? What was that like? Did he start it? Was he a cultivator by trade? Like what was, what was that like? So he grew his whole life. Um, and, uh, you know, him and my uncle, and uh, I had mentioned briefly before, you know, my uncle and um, my uncle's kind of the one later in life that outside of my homegrown had, you know, really showed me the fucking fire. Uh, but my father was just like, oh, he's a big supporter of cannabis. Um, 
like one of his favorite stories of me was when I was a kid was like, he had these plants in this ditch next to our old house. And uh, it was old school. He'd go out there and beat them down with a broom before we knew what super cropping was or any of that shit, you know? He's like, you beat them down with a broom and they come back stronger and bigger. And uh, he told me I come out there one day, he's out there beating his plants down. I come out there fucking wailing, man, like screaming bloody murder. Like, no, you're hurting it. Stop. And uh, so I always thought that was kind of funny, you know. Um, but, yeah, you know, big supporters. You know, my, my, my dad and my brother were close like me and my brother are. And, you know, cannabis was a big part of their relationship as it is mine and my brother's. And, yeah, just, you know, a lot of family roots, man, which is, uh, you know, I'm grateful to be home on the farm. My, my father passed last year. Uh, he had just taken over the family farm himself with my grandparents. And then that kind of happened and it, it stayed stagnant for about a year. And then my grandfather was just like, you know what, we got to get somebody in there and you're the one. So, um, yeah, me and uh, my partner, um, Heather Highlands on Instagram. Heather, we've, uh, we've been there now about six months and we're still just trying to settle in and get ready for next year. Beautiful. So I know from talking to you previously that, you know, growing up, you got exposed to kind of like a, a, a very drastically different uh, environments as a child from inner yeah. city to, to rural, you know, yep. how, were you, was that, were you moving through periods or, or how did that, how did that transpire where you, where you had that, that sort of two different roles growing up? Um, a lot of it was a constant back and forth and most of it was due to my dad's struggles with, um, unfortunately with narcotics after he had, um, become that test patient, um, that led into a lot of really bad stuff for him. Um, before we knew it, he was, uh, involved in a lot of crime. Um, him and my stepmother, um, robbed a pharmacy in our hometown back in the day. And like, just, you know, there's just so much bad was so wrapped around pharmaceuticals in my life growing up. And I would get out of there and I would go to the city and, uh, live with my mom and my brother um and uh and my sister my younger sister and um it just got to the point where you know like i got i would get in trouble i would get in trouble for weed i'd go back to my dad's you know i i, I was more comfortable in the woods with my shotgun and my dog and you know it was just uh it's kind of a weird thing man you know going from fucking shooting rabbits to not being able to have that mentality on the street <laughs> That must, that must have been wild. So, I mean, you know, starting to use cannabis at such a young age, having that unstable household, what, you know, what was school like for you? Horrible. Um, I dropped out at 15. I didn't do good. Um, severe, I'm severe ADHD, always have been. Um, I, I'm good. I'm like good at like social and like friends and stuff now, but a lot of it was through like my own, like, I, I had to really work at it over the years. I'm 37 now. And, you know, just, uh, school was rough, man. Um, when I, when I stepped away from school and that kind of thing, things were actually better for me. So I homeschooled. Um, my dad was actually really good about kind of nurturing that part of me, even though he had a substance issue. And, um, I got through, you know, I moved down to Florida, actually moved back my, mo my mother had moved to Florida when I was 17. And when I was 19, I went down there, stayed with her, got a job, uh, went to Daytona Beach Community College and was able to test out for uh, my high school uh, diploma. And uh, down there at the time, you could take a test and actually get a diploma from the Florida State Board of Education, as opposed to getting like a GED here, you know. So, um, yeah, man, just 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 a hell of a journey, you know, uh, with, with all that. And I just tried to stay at it and make sure I didn't, you know, fail myself really. hundred percent, man. It, yeah. You know, it's always a journey. So uh, you, you get your GED or sorry, you get your diploma in Florida you're with your mom. What happens next? Uh, you know, are you taking a job out there? Are you cultivating? <laughs> out there? What, what, what transpired? No, nah, man, I came back here um, between 21 and man, I don't even know a lot of it's a blur. Um, so basically what happened was at 21, I came back here and, uh, 
I was just doing the thing any normal kid did. I had my equivalency. Um, I got a factory job. I was working, you know, fucking slanging the chronic. I had a really good plug that no one had access to. And we had some shit called, we, we called it the monthly. Um, Uncle Sam, man, it was the first of the month, every month. And it was the fire of shit around. And uh, I just kind of was doing my thing. And then. Uh, what was the nose on it? Um, Like, was it, was it like a haze variety? No, was it no, like a people would talk shit, man. But like, that's what I remember as the true real deal skunk. Word. Like, and I, and I felt privileged to actually have that in my life. And now knowing like that things like that are, are fucking pretty much non-existent, like uh, really grateful to have experienced that, you know, whether it was a real skunk one or RKS or whatever, like we don't know, but that was the real deal skunk, you know, hands down. And uh, yeah, it was just, it, it was fucking cool. Um, but uh, I got in a, I got a bad car accident about uh, late 20. 2007 and uh, I was carjacked and got really hurt um and uh unfortunately ended up uh on a lot of painkillers myself um within a year I was I went from like standard like analgesic pills to uh painkillers like Norco to I was on methadone and uh after about two or three years of that and then just just realizing like I couldn't do it like uh, 2009 rolled around and I was like, you know, I got to get my medical card. Marijuana has always worked for me. Like I need to have my ass covered so I can like take care of myself. I want to get off this shit. And I did. I, I went and got my card. I was in the first 300 patients in the state. Um, I didn't have a place to grow. So I signed one of my best friends on as my caregiver and uh I got pulled over with a fucking half pound of that monthly before our paperwork ever went in and uh, ended up in jail with a pending PWID charge and uh, came up, came up with money for a really good lawyer and somehow got out of it, dude, with, with a misdemeanor possession charge and uh, just really grateful. He's, he's a a great attorney. He was one of the guys that actually uh, I found out later on that mentored a some of the now current like big attorneys, big marijuana attorneys here. So um, I just, you know, I proceeded after that just to, I quit methadone cold turkey on fucking bubble hash cookies, dude. Um, We put, we used to get these just like Wonka bars um, that used to come in from the West coast. And uh, um, I, you know, I was smoking my homegrown herb and we took one of those Wonka bars one day and we fucking ground up, probably an ounce and a half of that shit and made a batch of cookies. And that was it, dude. That was, that was the end of that. And, uh, my buddy finally got our paperwork in, he grew one crop and we split it up and, you know, he kept his part to cover his, his bills and whatnot. And, um, by that point I had a house and, um, my older brother had just moved back from Colorado and we were like, let's fucking get it. So, um, we started growing, um, a really good friend of mine who was a glass blower that I apprenticed for for a little while it gifted me my first cuts with cuts, which were uh, uh, fucking res sour diesel and uh, strawberry cough. And uh, so uh, may he rest in peace. Now he's not here anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, dude, we uh, we just went at it, and I, you know, I put my head down and um, no turning back, you know, uh, you know, I mentioned before it's like, like, like 12 or 14 years clean now from that shit. And, um, well, no, Oh nine, uh, 2010. So 12 years, you know? So yeah, dude. And I just, you know, I just kept my head down. I had no idea what I was doing, where I was going. Um, and it wasn't until in probably 2015 that I decided, you know, like, Hey, like I want to do something more with this. Um, I don't want to just keep growing, be one of these caregiver hustlers, like, like there's a future for me here. And, uh, and I started getting really serious about it. I had been managing a local head shop, um, as just kind of like a shift, you know, a shift leader type of thing, like close, close the drawer, a lot of responsibility, counting money, dealing with bullshit. And during that time, I, um, had the opportunity to really like become kind of an authority in Grand Rapids, uh, 
on early cultivation. Um, the first like grow Bibles and stuff like that, we were like the only place around you could find them, buy them. And people were really afraid to talk about this stuff. So I wasn't, you know, I, I implored anybody come down, buy a book. I'll run you through shit. Um, it got to the point where I started buying lighting setups and testing them. And then I would break them down and go set them up for patients and um, basically sell them these used setups um, that, you know, I, for some reason didn't like, but would work for somebody else and just kept trying to expand and build bigger and educate and um, kind of just built a platform for myself. And uh, that shop started going to shit in 2015. And that's when I was like, you know what, I'm out of here and I'm going to figure this out. I'm not going to get another job. I'm going to put my head to the ground. Um, and we did everything we could. We did, I did all the dumb shit, fucking open blast and you name it, man. And as soon as I realized, you know, uh, you know, the faults and some of that, and, you know, we make some changes and move on. And, um, the rest of it's kind of, you know, history at this point, I, I got a trap house and after that, and just banged out three bedrooms and slept in the living room and, and, and did that for a while. And yeah, man, just, what were those setups Were you, you know, were you poly in the walls and throwing up double ended or you know? oh, no, I never polyed anything too paranoid about moisture trap, man, stuff like that. Um, uh, running single ended, just adjust the wings, um, fucking window air conditioners, you know, like whatever you could do to get by, you know, max it out and then max it out. And when it starts overheating, fucking turn a light off, you know? And, uh, I had the upstairs of this house. So trapped out and, you know, there was times where I, I lost fucking 50 gallons of water fucking every other day in the upstairs floor of this house. And just, it was a mess, man. Like, yeah, we did, we did everything we could. And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, just kind of just built my reputation in, in, in West Michigan and Grand Rapids and just tried to really stay local and help, um, uh, there's a lot of sick people and they needed a lot of help. And then there was a lot of people that I helped with, you know, the same uh, addiction issues. And, you know, that's kind of a passion of mine. And this is, is kind of helping people that, you know, need a, need to reroute themselves medically and uh, spiritually. So what, uh, what genetics were you running back then? Um, fuck dude, a lot of original rare dangness stuff. Um, the ox forest fire, um, Tao Kirika and uh, hella name drop right here, space bound and down. Um, it's my best friend, uh, to this day. I consider this dude my best friend, and I was always blessed that he had his thing going, and uh, he was always, you know, at least at least a step or two ahead of me, and uh, had the space to, you know, search. and He would find great cuts and he'd pass them to me, and you know, I was fortunate to be able to carry those. and. Uh, he plugged me in on a lot throughout life, you know, throughout my career and plugged me in on people. And so, yeah, just, uh, the ox, the, the Tahoe cure, the forest fire was RD. Um, those were some really memorable ones, the Tahoe mainly, because that's like, that was like one of our original heavy hash trains, like, um, cataract Kush. That was, uh, that was a good one. Fucking, was that Cali? Is it Cali connection? I believe, but uh, yeah, dude, we just slews of shit, man. We ran through so much stuff. Um, definitely some real memorable things, and you know, a lot we've left behind, like uh, old Nebula, um, and uh, yeah, dude, the coughs, the sours, um, uh, that pu- the original like pineapple, um just a lot of west coast stuff that we you know managed to be able to to find and um bag seed whatever we could you know whatever we could get our fucking hands on and get in the dirt dude we tried that's awesome you said you know you were working at a head shop at the time were you involved in the glass scene coming up yeah so um i uh got into uh lamp working uh yeah probably late 2010 early 2011 and uh, I had apprenticed for this guy, John Lemaire, um, and that's the gentleman I told you about uh, that gave me my first cuts. And uh, he was great, uh, awesome dude, taught me a lot. And then uh, um, I moved on from him and uh, started working for this guy named Dorian Farmer. 
and Dorian actually had apprenticed uh, with Darby. So that was really cool. Like I got to learn a lot of his like um, cane work, his die curl prep. Um, and so like, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for Darby, especially these days, just because like, you know, I, I got to learn a lot of that stuff myself and got to, got to be taught it by somebody that, you know, was able to shadow him. Um, and, you know, I don't know how much, uh, you know, he always just told me that he, you know, was able to apprentice with Darby a bit. And, uh, uh, when you look at the work, it's, it's pretty obvious there was a connection there. So, um, that was pretty cool, man. You know, I feel fortunate for that. And it was a chapter in my life that, uh, was really enjoyable. I look forward to getting, getting a torch here soon at the new farm and getting my, getting my hands back on it. That's super cool. Did you, were you a collector? Did you collect specific ardor coming up? Um, yes and no. Um, you know, like being the way that I grew up, you know, I, I did struggle a lot. Um, and, uh, even while I hustled, like, you know, I hustled to move forward. Like I wasn't really like a squirrel saving my chips, which was kind of, you know, not always the best because you know i always i always spent what i had to move forward you know and and double up every time you know so i didn't save a lot i had a lot of love for glass and a lot of friends spacebound had the fucking dopest collection and it was like i didn't even need to have a collection you know, like me and that dude were, were were banging full mount flags on you know fucking titanium nails back in 2010 and uh he always had the sickest shit freak fucking 4.0, you know, you name it, like uh, micro, like just, just uh, original Mobius work, shit like that. So um, I'm a big sovereignty fan, man. I still got my original double down grid and uh, just a uh, bent neck. And that's, that's really my favorite piece till this day. Were you working with hash before the fresh frozen trend came along? Like, was that? Yes. So you were you talking we about that, like wh what was your transition like? Like when did that transition happen for you where your focus moved from flour to hash? So unfortunately my focus moved from flour to um, solvent extracts, unfortunately. Um, and uh, you know, no hate. I got a lot of love for solvent these days. Like if done right, there's some, you know, great, great fucking solvent 100%. out there. Um, but uh we used to just freeze and wash our our trim you know for ourselves and we were pulling fucking you know five star melt out of our trim back then air dried you know for ourselves and this was like this was like pre-solventless coin you know like you know back before like you know nika really started popping off and i remember when essential extract started popping off and we were like fuck yeah like this dude's on something like he's got these screens let's get some of these screens like these are tight you know and like all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, shout out Nick. I've always had a lot of love for him. And, you know, I followed that dude from kind of from afar for a lot of years and until like more recent years when we got to meet and whatnot. But um, yeah, dude, we were just, we were always trying to push forward. I got into BHO. Um, I did it. I did it for quite a lot of years. Um, just, you know, processing for other people to help pay my bills and um eventually i just decided i didn't really want to fuck with it anymore and uh i started getting into doing you know doing hash anyways and uh i uh just was doing bucket was, hash. man like i you know there was a time where you couldn't move traditional hash there was the, like bho was all the craze and, and the no. reason that solventless got to where it, it is and and arguably surpassed um solvent based extracts was emulating solvents you know and yeah emulating, like it was just playing catch up to what the bho boys excuse me were doing and so i think that you know it it, it completely makes sense to me that you had a period where you know you were in solvents and i think that uh anybody that i know who yeah. who had a uh a deep dive into solvent extractions is able to use that knowledge and chemistry to their advantage insolventless um so I, I think that you know that makes total sense like what what prompted that move for you was it somebody getting hurt was it just the market or, or what made you make that decision um honestly it was uh i was always i was always terrified of it 
you know, it, it was always really volatile. And uh, um, my friend, my best friend was just space Pawn was always not about it. He just was hundred percent, not, not fucking about it. And uh, you know, there was always kind of that separation in us because I was doing it. And uh, you know, I stepped away from it and just kind of, it wasn't for me anymore. You know, I just, I wanted to get back in. And so what happened really was like, I started focusing more on cultivation at that time. I just kind of stepped away from it. I started smoking more flour, buying hash where I could, uh, because I wasn't smoking it as much. Um, and, uh, I just, I just focused on that until I had uh, a network. And then I had kind of outsourced processing for a little while. Um, and that was kind of when the, I mean, the whole plant had kind of started, but there was, I guess there was also a period before that where, uh, uh, we were doing flower rosin, you know, flower rosin got really big for a while. And, uh, we were kind of crushing on that. He, uh, space bound had actually, uh, rosin tech had come out with some presses and, uh, we had managed to get our hands on the same, uh, base press that they were using at the time. And so him and his old man had built um, a, a bunch of them and, and uh, you know, I got one of them and was just pressing that Tahoe cure. Um, I mean, fucking 25% on, on dry flour, 30% on dry flour, you know, like killing it, killing it. And so I did that for a lot of years, you know, I guess now that I think about it and uh, I was even, I started moving flour rosin for a while. Um, because I was making, you know, a really high quality flower rosin and, uh, and then, yeah. And then, you know, focusing on the grow once, once my grow was good enough and I knew I was producing, able to produce like the flower rosin, like, okay, now I know I'm producing resin and, uh, kind of moved into, okay, produce a better resin that can be washed. And, uh, kind of in between that, I was introduced to natural farming. Um, uh, space Mountain had moved out to, uh, Washington state. And started working and um, I was lucky enough to be able to spend quite a bit of time out there with him and his fam and that's where I got to meet uh, Pacific Northwest Roots Kaya and uh, um, that was really cool like I got introduced to you know the natural farming community and uh, got to kind of pick up on KNF like really early and it's like introduction to the cannabis scene and uh, never got to go through the actual like training or anything, but, uh, was able to get taught everything secondhand by those guys. And I just, I would go out West and I would like, just be so full of like fucking love and energy and just like all of this shit from, you know, the energy out there. And I just come back to Michigan with so much motivation and just grind dude for another couple of years at a time. And, um, yeah, just got better, got better, got, you know, started having people wash my hash and then, Finally, you know, a couple of years ago, I just said, fuck this. Like, I want to wash my own hash again and uh, it's time. And, uh, you know, I built my lab. So. OK, so so there's a lot to unpack there. So are you full Korean natural farming now or, or are you implementing certain 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 points or how so no, no. So I, well, I haven't grown. Actually, I shut down my garden a year ago uh, when my father passed just to needed to kind of relieve that. Um, but in between that, you know, so I left that trap house behind um, in 2018. Um, I ended up having to have a back surgery. And uh, a few months before that, um, Heather and I started dating, uh, which was actually our, our second time starting to date. And, uh, things got, you know, pretty, you know, they, they, start, they went good really quick. And then, um, I had my surgery and then she had been, she had come off an injury, uh, playing rugby. And then two weeks after my surgery, she got hurt again. And, uh, at that point we were spending so much time together and her house was an hour and a half or an hour South of my place. And, uh, that place is actually where I'm sitting right now. And, um, she uh told me like hey you know like you want to get out of the trap like you know I, you know i'm in for the long haul let's do this and she's like i got this pole barn down here you know you can have half of it and uh i get down there and it's a 20 by 24 sticks and steel and i was like you know what 
I'm down, but I need the whole barn. <laughs> and uh, she was just like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, get it. And uh, I started building it out, you know, um, built a whole fresh space for myself. And that's when I started being able to really like implement, you know, KNF and natural farming. And um, I always had a, a want to do it in a little bit cleaner manner. Um, I was always really terrified of like indoor beds. Um, Michigan's really bad with, uh, with like bacteria, so to speak in the air. And, uh, we get a lot of people with weed here that tastes like their fucking block basement. And, um, uh, and, and it's a really simple concept. It's, you know, bacteria attaches to moisture and moisture transpires through your plant and leaves the bacteria in the plant. And, and then you're left with a, you know, a shitty tasting product. So, um, I built a fresh space and just tried to run clean, try to run natural, you know, fish emulsions. And then um, uh, Spacebound introduced me to Organics Alive. And I started really going in heavy on that stuff and doing, you know, a lot of research and whatnot with that. And uh, yeah, that's just kind of where it landed, you know. And I stayed, you know, just mostly like this uh, really heavy, less like indoor organic, but like, uh, like a recycling like kind of organic in pots like i don't you know i didn't i wasn't i wasn't one to reuse soil unfortunately like I, I would still buy soil and then all my soil i ended up dumping somewhere here in the yard where it needed it you know and uh help to replenish our place here and so yeah that's super awesome man so when you when you set up your lab again what what, what did your setup look like like were you running um roots or were you running stainless steel vessels or so run? i've always been a big fan of like hand wash hand paddles so when i started back up i didn't want to deal with machines i i had i had like so thoroughly been through everything talked to everybody you know just did my research again because the game had changed you know like at that at this point you know back and this was fuck 22 this was probably 20, 2019 then. And, uh, I just, you know, I wanted to hand paddle. So yeah, I went and got 25 gallon brew food grade brew and the bags and the paddle and, and just started going at it. I wasted fucking a year's worth of crops, you know, getting sub 3%, you know, like I remember the first time I put 3000 grams to, and lost 3000 grams to a bucket of fucking ice and water and got like 10 grams back and it was just like, Oh my God, like I have no meds now. Um, but, uh, you know, you live, you learn, that's part of the journey, but yeah, I, I basically ripped apart the front of my barn, um, and, uh, cleaned it up, got rid of it. It was basically a control room for my garden and a water room and shit. And I basically got rid of my veg space and just started like, making my flower room like more perpetual and i took a closet inside the house and set it up so i could cut clones and kind of do that and i set up that front room as my wash space and just kept grinding it's still my wash you know my wash lab you know today i we just we just finished uh fuck a little over two hundred fifty thousand grams um in the last six weeks out there so what uh what brand of wash bags do you use i fuck with rosin evolution all the way Right yeah, I, you know, like a lot of these bag companies, they're great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to talk shit. Like I can only say good things about all of them. But um, when I, when I got through like relearning hash for myself and I started doing production work, it didn't make sense to potentially use, use tools that were that high quality that could potentially get ruined when I had a high quality product right here that was a quarter of the fucking cost. And if anything happened to it, I could replace it. Um, I'm a big fan of having multiple bag sets. So if you have an issue, it's swap the fucking bag and keep going. Like, you know, like when you're running volume, man, you can't afford hiccups. So um, it's just a lot of forethought in that. And uh, Rosin Evolution always made sense. Uh, I had the privilege to meet him. He was at our table, right? Um, and, uh, that was really cool. So, um, yeah, shout out to them, man. Like I, I, I love their products and, and always have, and I've always been a big supporter of them. So yeah, no shout out Rosin Evolution. They've been a huge supporter of me 
my projects and you know I, I i love the ability to be able to swap out a bag set and not be thinking about it for a week you know what i mean yeah you get a rip you're gonna tear you're not you know it's not costing you fucking 200 dollars. you know 100 percent. are you running full sets all the time do you double up on any bags um do you have any sort of techniques as far as that goes so i bear wash in uh with a 220 lined drum um and uh i bear wash like that and then when i drain i actually still run an extra 220 bag in my set just as a safety catch but um i don't run a 90 bag unless i'm running melt um and and even then like depending on the strain i prefer a lot of 70 to 120 melt um i just uh, i always have it just uh there's something about you know that lower micron that that i've always enjoyed so um but normally yeah i don't i just you know i run you know pretty standard 45 70 you know uh 160 and then yeah and then clean bags you know i run a i run a, a 190 and a 220 always on the top just you always have that extra catch for you know contaminant and whatnot so so are you doubling up on your 220 or 220s in your wash vessel and then you have another 220 coming out yeah. yes yes yep um and you saying you you wash you wash bare or naked you don't wash in any kind of cubes or anything what are your thoughts there it jams up um depending on the material you know like that shit just uh, to me it just mashes and folds in those things like i've i've watched a lot of people wash with them i've seen a lot of different outcomes and uh i just there's I mean, I'll go back to Frenchie, dude. Frenchie, you know, we always talked about this, like, this, like, orchestra, this, like, symphony of ice and water and this flow that that goes in that barrel while you're doing that. And, you know, things like bags just interrupt that flow to me. And uh, there's just, like, it's just kind of a dance. And I just really always enjoyed that. You know, I, I enjoyed the bear wash, um, being able to uh, really, like, have my be able to stick my hand and you know and grab a, a nug and like look at it whenever i need to and inspect the material um and things like that so yeah just a big fan of the, of the bear washing man i just think there's a, a lot more to be a lot more a lot more control there what are your techniques around moving the material through the water you know building on you know or touching on frenchy um frenchy had the idea that the gland was actually separating from the excision point due to the, the the pressure created by the vortex in the water, not the agitation in the water. So when you're moving the water, do you have a specific motion that you're doing or, or a thought process that you're going through? I do. And it's kind of like this, like, it's kind of like a downward pushing, like figure eight almost, you know, like you're like, constantly like folding in like this you know and uh yeah it's just uh something i've noticed and and a lot of that's come through just experience and washing um fortunate enough to get some really big contracts and i feel like in the last like i haven't been like really washing heavy heavy like in the last few years like there's a lot of people that i'm washing a lot longer than me but in the last like Fuck man, in the last two years, I've probably washed six to seven hundred thousand grams of material. And like, you know, the 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 education is in the work, and it doesn't matter like how long you've been doing it. Like, I, you know, I'm fortunate to have um that amount of material to go through and really get my education that fast. So, you know, having a lot of knowledge about resin and enjoying, you know full mount hash you know at a previous time in my life like really gave me a fucking a serious edge and then you know once i had the opportunity to really just like have material at my uh you know to try to run through and it's just it just uh, it, it was it was the best learning experience where do you fall on that scale are you are you between rosin and melt do you do you tend to lean one way or the other i'm melt. i'm a melt guy all day uh in the end um Everybody loves rosin, you know, and it's become a replacement for a lot of BHO and, uh, 
it's just, you know, it's, it's way more favorable to the more, um, I don't even want to say uneducated users and just a lot of them don't care. You know, a lot of people are not into this like we are, you know, and, uh, what is it specifically about melt that attracts you to that over rosin? The truth, the fucking dead, honest truth. You can't hide a damn thing, dude. You can't fake. You can't fake the funk, dude. You can't, man. Like, and uh, but ex- expand on that for a non-maker who's listening to sort of understand what what it is that's truly pulling you as a as a maker and a a true connoisseur to the melt versus the rosin. Because it allows us to really like learn. It allows us to learn these different cultivars and what they have to offer. You know, and. and if you're if you're just collecting that mountain squishing those heads you're literally like throwing almost throwing the book in the trash at the end like um different plants have different things you know and that different you know different contents of different compounds like thicker cuticles thinner cuticles um you know terpenes uh terpenes that are lost to water quicker than others and you know like there's a million fucking variables in just that alone, like there's a certain truth and there's a certain aspect of making full melt that is not only like spiritual to me, but it like, it's made me, it's made me better. A lot of things it's created patience. It's created, um, the ability to like evaluate my work and myself and like, go fuck man. Like I got to try this again, but it's going to be four months. I got to grow it again. I've got to do certain things different in there again. And I've got to transfer this through this water into this product again. And I've got to find the answer, you know, and uh, so there's a certain truth to that. There's something that, you know, it kind of it edges us and it, it, and it makes us better. It forces us to be better at what we do, which is pushing the bar and making this community and this medicine better for for all the people here. There's nowhere, there's nowhere to hide with melt. That's for sure. There's nowhere to hide, dude. Like you can't make shitty melt. Like there's a lot of people that won't touch melt already. Like you need to, you got to have something, you know, really impeccable to, to stand out. Um, and, uh, you know, just, I just like good melt. I like, I like inspecting it. I like, you know, you put that fucker in the banger and, you know, watching it melt and then inspecting it after the fact and, how many reheats can it take before it cakes? Does it cake? Does it not cake? Does it, you know what I mean? Like it, it, there's, there's just so much there and it's, it's literally reading a book every time and it's just really enjoyable to me. What are your thoughts on air dried versus freeze dried? Uh, um, if it was my choice, I would only air dry. Um, I really like freeze dried. Um, I really like the expedition, like the expedition process of, of it and, and whatnot um but there's there's no art in a freeze dryer um and and i'll just you know i'll be you know pretty blatant about that there's there's no art in pushing buttons on a fucking freeze dryer um and a lot of the wash tech and stuff these days is pretty much the same you know we're sharing a lot of tech um not a lot of it's gate kept anymore but uh what some of these guys are doing with air dried in the long run is like is really cool like um, I got to my first time to really see air dried outside of like, you know, what me and like space bond were doing here for ourselves as medicine back in the day. And like, um, I got to go out to the last 215 Emerald cup in uh, 2017, I believe. And, uh, Pua, uh, Camden from Pua extracts. And, uh, um, I, I forget his name, um, full flavor um some of those guys you know like i got to see some real start seeing some real air dry kaya kaya's kaya's fucking air dried you know um and and stuff like that and so it really like it really dawned on me then like hey like this is the actual art aspect of this and you know this is really kind of where everybody separates themselves from each other and uh that that became really important to me um to kind of hone in on and uh yeah so that that's just you know i have big respect for that that's super cool man that that's a very cool perspective so like in keeping with that that kind of thread of art 
do you feel the same way as far as with machine washing with hash do you feel as though there's an art in the hand wash that cannot be transferred or, or captured in a machine wash somewhat um yes and no i mean um i'll be honest i'm really interested in the new hashtag systems um they oh, seem to uh, dude the way that they're the way the, just the top drive system and the way that their paddles built seems to actually mimic more of like what i like to do and uh you know i've, I've got a you know i've got a bad back and uh, a blown out shoulder from dirt bikes and shit so i'm looking forward to maybe getting into something like that in the future and trying it and seeing you know uh what it does you know like art moves forward you know my brother's a, a visual artist and he now uses technology and computers to to draw and i just think there's a certain uh, inevitability to technology and uh um that's kind of actually what the whole like organitron philosophy started on so i can't really deny that um because there is kind of like a whole philosophy to you know the name and 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 the journey and like what i started so let's talk about that you know what i wanted that's something i wanted to get into when did the organitron name come about and, and what is the, the meaning behind that um okay so it's kind of silly it's kind of stupid i just was looking for a cool name um um i'm really into heavy metal death metal like type music i uh was a music musician for a lot of years um i had been you know in and out a lot of my own bands doing projects and uh, i was lucky enough to get picked up by um for a tour uh by a, a rather large michigan band out of detroit called the black dahlia murder and I went on the road with them guys for uh, a few weeks uh, on a tour and uh, just kind of as a, I was a tech, you know, doing uh, uh, basically backline tech and guitar tech. And uh, when I had kind of come out of that, um, I was listening to an old Sepultura album one day and there's a song on there called Orgasmatron and uh it's actually a cover and I forget the original band's name, but I was just like, you know, I was really in my weed shit then. And I was like Organitron and it just, it just kind of clicked. But at the same time I was, I was doing a lot of reading. Um, I was still, I was still like only a few years out of, you know, addiction and was still just like working on myself a lot. And um, I was reading a book at the time and I came up with just this idea to like philosophize like my journey and like what I wanted to do. And basically it comes down to we as humans, like uh, we're progressing in society and the world and we don't really, we're, we're, a lot of us are losing time for ourselves, for our spiritual selves. And as we progress and we develop all this technology and shit, like we've really got to like stop and like accept that. And we need to start utilizing this technology um, to free up time, to free up time for our spiritual selves and, uh, you know, really kind of like make other things happen for us and be responsible about the technology that we're using. And so that kind of, you know, brings me back to, you know, the hashtag thing, like it's stuff like that, that, you know, I'm interested in because, it does kind of align with, you know, my philosophy and being able to create more time for myself and be able to, you know, do these volumes in, in a way where I feel that they're aligned with, you know, my own personal, like, art quality. So, man, I think that that's a, a super good message and, and goal to have. And, and, you know, I think that no name is a silly name because, you know, these are the brands that resonate with, consumers because they have like identity tied to the person behind it so i think that's super cool um i wanted to ask you about i want to ask you if there's any tools in your lab that you consider indispensable for example like uh, uh a spoon bent a certain way or a uh, um any type of tool that that you know you really use that is sort of unique to you in your lab? Is there anything that stands out? Honestly, no, man. No, like I've got two spoons. I've got a, a stainless ladle and a stainless spoon. 
and a small stainless spoon for sieving. And other than that, there's not really a lot, you know, like um, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. You know, I, I don't, I try not to attach myself to things like that. Like, um, and uh, I just, I just feel like this, this, like I said, the, the wash and especially the wash end of a lot of this is just, it's pretty simple. Like, you know, we, we share a lot of tech now and we really don't, we really don't got to get, you know, that deep into it. I feel like less is more uh, in a lot of ways. And I feel that way, you know, even about, you know, farming, you know, less is more. Interesting. No, I think that, I think that's a very cool perspective. I wanted to ask you as somebody who's worked with a lot of cured material before moving over to fresh frozen, have you encountered anything that you prefer to work with cured or semi cured, like a Jesus tech, um, then fresh frozen, or would you say across the board, your preference would be fresh frozen, fresh frozen, yeah, fresh frozen. I mean, I'm still not even a big fan of SIF. Like I, I just, it, there's something about it. I just, it, it, it doesn't like when that, when that cuticle dries and hardens, like, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it, man. Like, uh i just feel like like having that water really like cleans everything away from it um you see me you see me at 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 the event dude i brought a fucking 10x loop like you know like i looked at everybody's shit like what do you got in there like you know because i've seen a lot dude there's you know, people with like the older bag sets with like the nylon line shit you you know you find fibers you find pieces of plastic and shit in the hash and it's you know, I just like to look, I like to look deep, you know, did you paddle too hard? Did you paddle too light? Like, and, and, you know, a lot of those things really like shine out to me. So. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about, I want to ask you about rosin a little bit. Um, yeah. So are you playing with jams and applying heat uh, in your post process or is that something that you, you shy away from? Um, I shy away from it. I prefer cold cure, um, but I do cold cure and like, I don't want to say a warmer room, but you know, standard, like I don't cold cure and you know, 60 or 40 degrees or whatever the fuck, like, you know, I, I, I put the shit in a jar and it's in my house, you know, and yeah, it's room temp. You like it warm. It's 70 degrees. And, um, I played with a couple different techs over the years. Like there's like, some different ideas about how far you want to let like that jar cure before you whip it. And, uh, you know, the, my first couple of them, like, you know, I, I made some really fucking shitty dry rosin, man. Like, and it, and it fucking happens to everybody. And, uh, everyone was just like, dude, you just got to whip it more. You just got to whip it more. And, uh, you know, I'd whip it more and more and more and it just dry the fuck out more and more and more. And then, you know, the next batch I was like, all right, I'm going to play with this again. And you just kind of figure it out. Like there are, there's like an early stage tech where people are like, Oh, let it run to like 80% turp separation, you know, and then get it like while there's still just that tiny bit left and you'll get that like, you know, nice wet, wet look or whatever. And then I really liked for a while, like letting it cure, like long, long cure, like two weeks, like let that turp separation fully happen and then let that turp separation fall back into the jar, like completely disappear back into it. Um, I don't like the in-between. I don't like cracking that jar when all that syrup's on top and then mixing it back in. Um, I just, I don't know why. So I've found kind of like the sweet spot and it's like, when I start to see them bubbles on top with a couple of like, a little bit of brown bubbles like the turp separation is fucking ready to push through that's usually about now when i when i whip it down and i'm able to get a really nice you know texture and um i i really enjoy that and i you know i get a cold cure and i get a good wet batter that's you know pretty close to what a lot of these guys are putting out with heat tech but um Do you find that heat, to be consistent through different cultivars um pretty consistent you know like um honestly yeah pretty it's pretty fucking consistent some of them will lock up a little bit harder some of them won't um some of them will stay wet and then like 
they'll they'll be wet when you put them in the jar and they'll fall down nice but then when you scoop it out it's definitely a little bit more rigid and and like you know like a like cakey uh but wet you know so um yeah man and 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 a lot of it's too it's just creating that art and that appearance and you know um trying to make it check all the boxes really that's really it it's just how do we how do i how do i make this fucking shit check all the boxes and it's so hard when you you know are running you know all these different cultivars and you really got to learn them a hundred percent is any is there anybody in the market in michigan doing fresh press um yeah so uh he actually just moved into uh compliance but the biggest guy here that was doing fresh press was uh uh it goes by diggity dank trip scientific um it's cool kid uh he was a patient for nika uh, apparently way back in the day and that's how he got his start and uh he's a big big fresh press guy um i'm a fucking asshole about fresh press like people hate me but the minute you show me fresh press i just like get it out of my face it's, that shit's not done it's not done it's fucking unfinished hash man get that shit away from me it's fucking not done so but a lot of people like fresh press terps like um I just, I rarely get a fresh press that doesn't taste like fucking wet hay. I like, I like the brutal honesty. I, I just, yeah, I, man. Like a lot of people I'm, dance around the subject if they feel that way and, and it's refreshing to hear. Yeah. Just, I'm not going to dance around that one, dude. Not dancing around any fucking fresh press, bro. That's too, yeah, no, I, 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 for me, it's, it's rare to find a fresh press that's, that's more impressive than it's cold cured counterpart um i think that they exist i think you can pheno hunt them yeah but it's always fascinating to me to see the 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 fresh press uh popularity in 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 california i just because in canada it's non-existent so just because Um, we're so far away from each other the only fresh press that was ever shared was between the makers and his small circle and that was it Everything else would be cleared out and sent. I, I don't really mean to like, I don't like putting people like, or accusing people of it, but it, it, it's like, to me, Fresh Press just seems like you're rushing shit. Like, you're either trying to make your money or you just don't want to do the work. And like, you're just trying to get it out. And, uh, you know, some people do like it and, and, and I don't hate. Um, I know there's one real memorable jar of Fresh Press that I've had in my life. And, uh, uh, shout out my boy uh, Jason, fueled by Full Melt, and Cat. Uh, he used to work with Moonlight Melts here, but uh, I was gifted a jar of this Lilac Diesel a couple years ago, and uh, still to this day, that's probably like one of the only fucking fresh press jars that I've ever been like, holy shit! Like, and uh, that was a gem, and it's gone. And, you know, we'll never see it again. So that's pretty cool. Absolutely. I definitely, I've, I've had a handful of fresh presses that are super special. I mean, it's not my favorite material to work with by any means, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. No, I've definitely had, had a couple of jars that are, that are <clears throat> stand out. Um, I wanted to ask you about sun grown resin. Um, you actually won a sun grown cup. I know you're a big proponent. You touched on it earlier with your father sort of teaching you and things starting out in the garden on a, on yeah. a large plot. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences with sun gro- sun grown resin and, 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 and what your thoughts are on the matter? Um, some more truth, you know, like uh, sun, sun grown don't lie either, you know, like it's the truest form uh, of these plants. Like no matter how hard we try to, play god indoors dude we're we're not you know and uh just the expression and whatnot that comes out is so much different you can run the same plants indoor and outdoor and have completely different profiles and uh different growth structure different different everything and um sun grown to me has just always crushed indoor like whether it be terps or yield or like like all of it it's always checked all the boxes for me pardon me um so like that's just 
kind of been a thing, you know, and because that was like my background, like, you know, I've been kind of pushing that pretty hard here in Michigan and trying to like get people to um, kind of recognize that, you know, we can produce high quality sun grown here in the Midwest. It just takes a certain skill set and a certain diligence and a certain integrity. Um, is it a, a skill set? Is it a genetic or is it a, like a cultivation methodology? Like what is going to produce good? Because it's it's a region that's not known for its outdoor cultivation. Um, it's all of the above. Genetics are extremely important. You know, in Michigan, like you can't you can't grow GMO here. You can't grow long flowering sativas here. Um, we had one of the best seasons we've had in a decade this last year. And uh, I've seen some really good, you know, things like GMO resin and whatnot. These guys, you know, we had good weather in the end of October and these guys were able to throw their plastic back up and take some of these plants into the first week of November. And uh, they really crushed it. But like genetics is a big one. Um, you know, having a certain pathogenic resistance, um, bug resistance, uh, stuff like that. You know, a lot of corn farms here, a lot of apple orchards. So we're really subject to things like aphids and russet mites in, um, you know, like, uh, growing outdoors, you've, especially here, you've got to have, you know, that organic knowledge, you've got to have that IPM knowledge, you've got to have that diligence and, uh, is 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 uh counter is this sounds to what i'm saying like it's still like kind of a less is more thing um just uh kind of that natural farming journey taught me a lot about you know uh different ipms through you know banker plants and you know different just methodologies of 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 just keeping things at bay um beneficial bugs um and whatnot you know that's another thing like you know people complain about you know aphids and this and that and but they're gonna go and fucking dump a bunch of ladybugs and other shit on their plants that also take shits on your plants like and everything else so um there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that a lot of growers um and hash makers that they kind of don't talk about because it scares a lot of people um and uh i just think like you know a lot of it's like stuff that's very true to uh, what's going on. And uh, a lot of these practices are still done indoors, even with all these, you know, natural gardens now indoors, these guys are still using beneficial bugs and, uh, n you know, neem neems and, and stuff like that. And um, I just feel like outdoor, we have a better buffer uh, against a lot of things. So you don't necessarily like have to always just like jump and use something. Um, it's really, it, it's really easy to kind of less is more like you get a, you get 12, you got your 12 rec plants out here or something in a field and aphids start to get one of them. Let that motherfucker go because they're all going to go to that plant and leave the rest of your shit alone. And, you know, so it's just little things like that, that come with the education of growing, you know, outdoors here in Michigan and like understanding, you know, plant cover, um, greenhouse, um, and the difference between, you know, running full season plants and, and running greenhouse plants. So. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely a steep learning curve. I think that there's a steep learning curve cultivating cannabis everywhere. I yeah. think growing, cultivating in places like Michigan and 98% of Canada, um, you know, you're going to have to dial that genetic in for that region and that's going to involve spending time hunting that genetic in hunting that you know in my opinion that seed stock and it's really hard when you bring in the cut from a different area that has dramatically different you know that was hunted under dramatically different environmental conditions yeah. and try yep. and so, sort of push that square peg through a round hole so i think as things continue to go out in the open and you know everybody can agree that no there's been no point in time where more plants are being pheno hunted than today and oh, so yeah. you know i think that we're heading towards a direction where we can have i mean even autos i know there's a large in group of individuals that are you know pushing uh auto breeding and, and trying to pull shoulder seasons of resin and and you know i think that's great i think that the more 
resin that we can have available and accessible at different price points, the better. So um, I'm definitely all for that. I wanted to ask you, um, and I know that you're a big proponent of organic farm, uh, of organic farming and organic inputs, but um, as a as somebody who participates in toll processing, I know you've seen a lot of material, you've passed, a lot of material has passed through your hands. Have you been able to make any observations of salt grown material versus organically grown material? Like, have you had the opportunity to see cultivars that have been grown in salt conditions that have also been grown organically and, and been able to compare those outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually like took a short break from organic farming for like a year and uh, I was, I really had an interest because I, I've been an organic farmer since day one. So I wanted to kind of learn the other side of stuff just to say that I, I, I knew like, because I didn't, I didn't. And I, I found myself trying to speak on things sometimes that I didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. And I was like, you know what? I got to stop. I got to suck this up. And uh, it cost me in, in the long run, dude, it bit me in the ass, but I learned a lot. I stepped back. I, played with like Athena and shit in front row and whatnot for a good year plus and uh, was building a bunch of dosatron systems for a few guys here in Michigan um, that have, you know, ma made some waves for themselves. And that was kind of cool. I, I learned a lot, but what I learned is that a lot of this is a lot, a lot of, a lot of nutrient, uh, type growing a lot of, you know, inorganic type growing is you're, you're forcing this plant, you're pushing this plant in a way that it's not meant to be pushed. And, uh, it's like, it, it's, it's forcing it to do others, other stuff that, that the resin is just not, you know, naturally like, um, genetically supposed to do. And in the long run, like what I, what I mainly noticed was like more, um, more of like a waxier cuticle, um, thicker cuticles guaranteed, um, way less terpenes guaranteed. Uh, and then, um, not to mention just like, and I think that also has to do with like the mediums that these, you know, nutrient systems require, you know, like rock wool is just, it's, it's trash, you know, it's, it's, and not only is it extremely hor horrible for the fucking environment, it's it's just, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's just a base for that plant to attach its root system to so you can force feed it. And uh, that's just not something that I, I find that's very appealing. Like, none of us want to be, like, strapped to a rack and, and, and fed that way, you know? So uh, I think, you know, it just kind of goes to say any living thing, like, would prefer to not be treated that way. And I feel like what any living thing can put out when it isn't treated that way, when it's treated the right way is always going to be of uh, a higher quality and of an abundance, whether it's, you know, humans as energy or whether it's plants and these plants as resin. I think that's a, that's a fair assessment. Um, I wanted to ask about resin mixing. And your thoughts we're seeing it a lot it's gaining in popularity a lot of uh competition entries are blends whether it be a 90 10 or a 50 50 it's some type of blend yeah is that something that you're a proponent of or, or are you are you doing um, your own lab what are your thoughts i've done a lot of blends um people like blends they're they're a thing um i am just I don't know. So I kind of got mixed feelings about it in a competition setting. Um, I feel like it takes away uh, and really robs the genetic of its potential to shine in a competition setting and even robs the breeder of, you know, the notoriety that they deserve for that plant when it does prove itself above all. And uh, I, uh, you know, as far as like for the end user, yeah, but I, I think there's a fine line there on where like these blends should have a place. I think that, you know, very quickly we're heading towards a place where a uh, maker will distinguish himself by only putting out single plant uh, offerings, you know, and yeah. that's going to become so common that it's going to be 
assumed it's a blend unless otherwise specified. And I don't know, I, I, I haven't generated a, an overall feeling about it. That's just where I think it's going. I mean, you'd be hard pressed, I believe. I'm not a wine drinker uh, or a drinker, but you'd be hard pressed to, I, I think that almost all wines are, are blends at this point. So I'm, I'm yeah. not against it, but I think that your comment is really interesting. And, and the first time it's been brought up is that in a competition setting, it might not be appropriate or it might be very soon we're going to have a blend category. Um, yeah. And I think that that's something interesting that, that should be discussed because um, I, I think that I really like the, the idea of that where, you know, I think there should be a blend category. And, and individual cultivars are in competing with individual cultivars because if you can have an individual cultivar a cut that out competes blends, that's like, I mean, that's double special. And so yeah. if something has to be double special to win, then it's not a fair, I don't think it's a fair competition. No, and I think it just really takes away from, um, takes away from that. Yeah, it just kind of, it's, it's it's definitely i feel like it makes the the playing field unfair because somebody can take something that looks really great and add something that has a really great terpene that doesn't necessarily look so great but now it was a five out of ten on look and a ten out of ten on uh you know taste but now these guys got a, a fucking nine across the board because they mix these together and that's just you know that's like that's like Barry Bonds shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that. That's like, that's like sticking some steroids in your shit. You know, like I just don't think it's very fair to just to the situation. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. Like there's a bunch of ways to look at it, but I mean, I think that what we need to do is as a community, we need to keep competing and having these friendly competitions, discussing yeah. different ways to compete and, and kind of voting with our dollars as a community on what competitions we like the best, because I mean, that's how you get better. I mean, is is from yeah. the competition, and I think that having these large scale corporate competitions are fine, but we need to have all different levels, from you know small, you know regional to to large, you know international. And so, I I love seeing more and more of these uh, like hash gatherings and competitions forming at all different sizes. I think it's it's super important same i think it really like it's it, it, it gives us all a chance to raise the bar together and uh kind of like all put our heads together and then walk away and go okay guys this is what's next let's all work on this and then let's all come back and kind of bring stuff to the table and and see where we can go i want to talk to you i want to ask you about hash yields and what your thoughts are um with you know these last two years we've seen a lot of breeders starting uh, seed breeders starting to focus on um, breeding for solventless extraction. You've got some breeders who have do been doing it a lot longer than others. But, you know, what are your thoughts as a cultivator on the plant's maximum ability? Like, do you think that we have we have reached the, the maximum yield potential and we're just playing with flavors at this point with, for example, with, you know, a GMO or something? something of the like, like a strawberry banana, or do you think that, you know, with the right breeding and the right plant work that we can actually get more resin per, you know, per square inch than we, than we're already seeing on some of these cultivars? Um, I think there's a cap, but I also think that there's like a different way of growing. Like breeders are, you know, looking to breed resin, but they're, you know, and, and increase resin yields, but there's also a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration. Um, a lot of people that grow don't want to grow airy material. And unfortunately, airy material is the best for washing because it has the most surface area. Um, and that's really important when you're trying to like get those heads out of that material in your wash bucket. Um, yeah, there's just, uh, there's a lot that goes into the breeding. I think that, I haven't really got to experience yet. I'm looking forward to starting my first breeding projects this year. And uh, I've waited a long time and kind of put a lot of thought into how I'm going to do that. But there's a, there's a certain threshold. You know, I feel like these plants can only hold so much resin regardless. And uh, 
I mean, you look at strains like purple punch and shit and uh, a lot of these, there's a lot of strains out there that look like they're just covered in resin and they wash great, but they're a lot of stalk, you know, and uh, they're not heads and, uh, or, or they're just, you know, greasy or they're just not the, not the kind that are going to drop or, or crack. And there's a lot of, now that we're focused on this, I think breeding is going to be good going forward. And um, what's really cool in, in the notice to me is that like somehow all of our fucking hash love and wook asses have <laughs> figured out that, you know, the history of this plant was resin. And now uh, in a new age, we're coming back around to like some of these traditional like methods, but like so refined and we're bringing back this plant as like for resin. You know, and uh, that is the coolest thing to me is like we're bringing we're bringing like traditional like cannabis resin making back to the platform, whereas it was robbed from us in the United States for a long time due to, you know, plant legalities, you know, cannabis legalities, period. A hundred percent. I mean, I think that that, you know, the the resin and the quest for quality has, you know, pretty much developed into a lifelong passion for a lot of us and we're all kind of on that journey just forever looking and examining and trying to kind of you know bring more people in and introduce more people so i i i definitely definitely share that sentiment i wanted to um i wanted to ask you about before we move on from from more more of the technical side yeah so i wanted to ask you about yields and ask you how much um, focus as a maker are, and thought have you put into yields and how you're measuring them because you know I think that dependent on the water weight of the input material and a number of factors there's so many variables going on that you yeah. know almost the, the the most responsible way to measure any garden at this point would potentially be if you were going to rosin would be you know rosin per square foot um but is that is that something that you've put much thought into as far as you know how we calculate yields as, as a community and and the flaws that are within it yeah i think we need to come up with a better metric than going from like like a uh, whole plant fresh frozen weight to you know that yield i think like something like a resin per square foot would probably be a better metric um because I've seen numbers all over the place. I'm a big numbers guy when it comes to this kind of thing. And I've seen dry farmed plants hit 7%, 9%. And I've watched, you know, the same material come in wet and hit, you know, five and six. And it's like, you know, the same cultivars, I mean, and uh, hit five or six. And it's like, okay, well, we know why the, the yield there is skewed, but like, when I'm, you know, when I'm washing this stuff as a contract for somebody and I got to explain to them that this one had more water weight and this one was dry farmed and this is why. And, you know, it just, it makes a lot for these guys to understand. Um, so I think like they're really, we do really need to like settle down on like a proper uh, yield metric soon and, uh, you know, standardized, kind of standardize how we're gauging that and, and moving forward with that and um especially as like rosin becomes bigger in like a medical the medical and recreational scenes and and on these like commercial markets do you see rosin and dabbing growing quickly and exponentially over the next three to five years yes <clears throat> yes absolutely man like um there's no doubt about it it's kind of the new way um a lot of people are getting away from wanting to like consume any sort of like combusted carbon material flour regardless like i'm a joint smoker i love smoking joints but um a lot of people can't afford to smell from their job or you know there's there's multiple reasons and dabbing has always kind of like you know allowed people to achieve a level a level of medication needed for themselves um but incognito and so there's there's definitely like a big future here for you know for just for dabbing in general that's awesome that 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 warms my heart um i want to talk to you or ask you 
uh, you know, you have a really unique perspective being one of the first 300 people in Michigan to receive uh, that medical license, you know, from a, from a boots on the ground perspective, what, what was uh, licensing and regulation like? Um, and, and, you know, what kind of grade or, or what kind of assessment would you give what, what was done well or what was done very poorly in your, in your opinion? Um, it's kind of weird, you know, like I don't have a lot of quarrels with the way things went here. Um, uh, in Michigan at first was a shit show, uh, very much like, I'm not going to say as bad as Oklahoma by any means, but, uh, it was wild west here for a while. And, uh, you know, unfortunately it put a lot of us in line to essentially become a victim of the war on drugs. And that, that really kind of like, that hurt a lot of us. Um, you know, I've been through raids, my friends have been through raids and they've hurt us all. And, uh, and all because like the state really didn't know what the fuck they were doing, how they wanted to do it. And then to disconnect between local and state governments, you know, and, uh, that was a huge, that that's really like the biggest thing still is like the disconnect, uh, between local and state governments. Like, um, <clears throat> I've kind of watched it through the years and, um, I can't argue with much, you know, we're, we're allowed to do a lot more here than a lot of people across this country. And I've always been grateful for that. Um, and, uh, um, not a lot of people like <laughs> our, our governor and our AG now, but, um, they're pretty lax on us for the most part, uh, I feel. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a good journey. Like, um, I've not, you know, had too many problems. Um, you know, the first time I was raided, they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. And my, my roommate had to get on the computer and literally print out the fucking legislation for the cops. Like it, it they didn't even, they didn't even know what the fuck they were doing there, you know? So, um, yeah, man, it's just, it's been wild. It's, it's been, it's been all over the place, but, uh, a lot of us have made do, a lot of us have made it through. Um, but in the same right, it's also, it's also left the platform open and this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's left the platform open for anybody to do this shit here. Um, and, uh, we have, and once we went recreational and we were allowed 12 recreational plants, now you had everybody that was afraid of getting a medical card able to just now grow 12. And then you've got all these caregivers that, have been, you know, legacy since, you know, the beginning or before that even. And, you know, they've got real farms and, you know, they're not affording to make a living because their buddy would rather grow their shitty 12 plants, you know, um, and, and, and then sell it to, and, and then sell it and step on toes. And just, it's, it's hard. Um, but it's not wrong. You know, people should be allowed to cultivate for themselves. Um, you know, I, I very much agree with that, but, uh, it's, uh, it's a big, it's a big fucking pool here right now of, uh, good, bad, and ugly, you know? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a big market. Um, overall, Canada, California, North America, the cannabis market's in a bit of a tough spot. Are you optimistic about the next three years or do you feel as though things have got to get a little bit worse before they get better? Um, would you say for myself or just in general, like in North America? Yeah, not for yourself, not for yourself. In general. Yes. Um, I think they're going to get better. Um, I think that there's a lot of people, especially right now, uh, we're unfortunately in a recession in our country. So it's forcing a lot of the people that thought they could get into this for money out and uh they're realizing that they can't do it anymore and um it's gonna it's gonna gonna restoke the fire it's gonna help you know the legacy farmers that have been here reestablish. even if they're hurting right now and they don't think they're gonna make it through um, they might have to shut down for a year but then when demand goes back up you know the few that were good at it will get back in while everybody else We'll just be like, I already tried my hand at that. I'm out. Uh, you know, it's cheaper for me to just buy meds. Prices are down, you know, and uh, I think 
I think we're going to go back up and we're going to stabilize a little bit. Um, I think luckily for the hash market, it's not really swayed much. And uh, shout out to, you know, all the farmers and processors that have really stuck to their guns um, and, and uh, producing, you know, a quality product that they can, you know, have a price tag on that has been able to stand in this market. Yeah, no, that's... That's, uh, you know, that's good to hear that the, that the hash is, has held strong. I think that that's been a saving grace for a lot of a lot of different markets um, <clears throat> North America. But I want to I want to ask you, you know, as a as a guy transitioning from traditional into into the legal, like is is what do you what do you see as the biggest hurdles in the current licensing system for somebody in, in a similar situation as yourself? um zoning 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 the disconnect between state and, and local governments it's really hard to find a place to get zoned to get a, you know even a piece of land to start um i by the powers that be were graced to be able to end up at the farm that i'm at and our um township was announced uh as social equity um two years ago so not only are we social equity and we're zoned but you know i've got i'm a caregiver i've got previous charges i've got so it's 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 going to allow me to step into licensing for you know half the cost as far as administrative fees go um than most people um and uh i'm i'm really fortunate for that and looking forward to that but like you know there's a lot of people here that aren't so fortunate in that are going to end up not really having this career in the long run because they just aren't going to be able to find a place to call home. Absolutely. What so what are the plans moving forward with Organitron? Is it is it all single source in house? Is it a, a processing hub for multiple farms? What what's your vision with, for the company? Um, I'm going to maintain my relationship right now with the grow father. Um, probably you know I I, I would say indefinitely. Um, until you know he decides otherwise but uh that's pretty much it you know I, i'll do side contracts for a few friends but uh the future for us is single source this farm is you know we're going to be moving into a micro that's going to require us to only be able to do just that we're only going to be able to produce uh our product wash our product and distribute our product we're not going to be able to mess with anybody else's products um no one's going to be able to buy our biomass um, the way that it's set up, it allows us basically to move into traditional licensing, like, and do it the same way we've been doing as caregivers, but just pay taxes finally. That's 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 awesome. Yeah, I don't want to do more than you know what I can handle. It's it's me and uh, you know Heather, my fiance, and uh, we're you know we intend to get married later this year. We've got a date set, and uh, we've got a lot of you know journey and dreams ahead of us, including. Uh, a side venture on that farm to produce um, cut flowers, actually, as well. So um, with my cultivation background and her love for floral, she's actually she works for a florist and that's something that she's always loved to do. So we've got, you know, kind of multiple ventures and I don't want to chew off more than I can because I also don't I want to I only want to make hash and I have zero intention on putting out flower at all like and i just want to produce good high quality fucking hash at a lower scale so i can keep the quality up and keep my costs down yeah. and uh i i have a zero intention on stepping outside of that man i i think a focused man is is a is a dangerous man so that's that's uh i i commend you for for not trying to you know bite off more than you can chew and try and satisfy and, and fill every skew i think that you know, people with focus are 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 definitely the ones to watch. Um, I want to talk to you about Ego Clash. Yeah, uh, we we got to we got to judge Melt together. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, we we're definitely sitting at, at the girls' table, which was super awesome. I was sitting beside my very close friend Hannah of Mission Hill Melts, and there was uh, Emily and and and. Um, just it was it was it was a very cool cool event. So yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about uh, your experience. Like, was that your first ego clash? Yes, um, super fortunate to be there. Um, I'm lucky to be there. Uh, 
I was just chopping it up with Kaya one day, dude. And he asked me how I was doing. And I said, just, I'm good over here, man. And just, you know, doing my thing, just trying to put in the work. And I just kind of made a joke. I was hoping to get that ego invite one day. And he was like, bro, like pull up. I'm like, what do you mean pull up? And he's like, he's like, I'm going to plug you, bro. Let's see if we can get you in here. So um, he did. They announced. I didn't get, I didn't get announced with the initial announcements. It was Organa Melts and Turp Wizards. Shout out them, you know, to Kyle and I aren't as tight as as Connor and I, uh, Turp Wizard. But um, yeah, man, I was really stoked when they got announced. And then, uh, you know, I was a little, I was a little bummed and, and then, uh, you know, Kyle was like, dude, fucking ring his line. Tell him I told you to tap in. And I did. And uh, he straight up was like, why are you special? <laughs> and I dude, and like, I mean, and y'all know Brandon's energy. Like, I love it. And uh, I just shouted at him, you know, like, this is, you know, this is why this is why I'm me. And uh, he was like, bet stay on standby. And I was like, whatever that means, like, this dude's going to call me four days before ego. I'm going to buy a plane ticket. And sure enough, five days too, he messaged me back and was just like, I was sitting at a uh, midnight diner with uh, my fiance and my, my brother. And uh, uh, he messaged me and was just like, show me melt picks, no rosin. And I was just like, Oh my God, here we go. And I just started hitting him with him, dude. And that was it right there. He, he sent me the invite and, uh, um, I thought I was going to have a heart attack and <laughs> I didn't eat my food. I paid the bill. I left. I went home. I barely slept and I started making travel arrangements. Um, and uh, and that was it, man. Like, yeah, just geeked. Geek. I've been geeked since. Um, um, things have been pretty rough. Like I said, I lost my dad last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, just like with this being something that he put me on, you know, it felt really good to be able to like get out there and just you know, continue this. Like, um, I really needed that recharge and to finally be in an arena, um, with people that I actually felt like I was really competing with, you know, I've, I've won quite a few awards for melt here in Michigan. And unfortunately, um, they haven't been stacked competitions, you know, they've been rather easy wins and like, I'm, you know, I'm stoked to have, you know, some cool trophies on a shelf, but they're not, they're not, they're not hugely accomplishing to me, you know, like, and uh, to be able to be in that arena with people that are like, actually like going to make me better was like, it's really big to me, you know, and I'm really fortunate for that. And uh, I felt like the vibe was great. Um, I made a lot of friends. I vibed with everybody, um, including Brandon. And I'm really looking forward to hoping that I get called back out next year to, to be sitting at that table again, man, and to bring my best work and to, to really show because this next year I will be single source and uh you know um if given the opportunity dude I'm I'm, I'm fucking coming swinging lights out 100 percent dude that's so awesome I yeah uh, I'm stoked I feel like you know if, if as long as you're polite and 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 nice and pass the sniff test it, the, the invite comes easier the second year so yeah yeah I hope to yeah. I hope to be there myself and I hope to see you there as well um, yeah. So, I mean, coming off ego and being in the position that you are, you know, what are some of the top rosin, belt, or flower that you've seen that sort of sticks out from from the last, you know, few weeks or months of, of your life? Um, Man, right off the top, something I can't stop thinking about is that fucking Jishka Berry you let me dab at the table when I got there. Holy shit. I don't even remember who made that, but that's triple G. That's uh, really, yeah. Man, he fucking made. shout out to, yeah, dude. Like, um, I grew the shishka berry back in the day, um, the regular shishka berry, and that was something that was really like memorable to me. And uh, I heard you and you know uh, Adam talking about that last night, even, and uh, I was on the live with you guys for a little bit and uh, just kind of listening in and. Yeah, man. Um, some of that stuff, I, I'm really excited to see some of these older cultivars come back now that we have a platform for hash and we can approach these in a different way. Um, I'm really excited to see them get spliced into the breeding that's going into the resin and, you know, some of that stuff. So um, I used to hate GMO, but now I'm a big fan. I don't know what happened. I just I think it was just it was a big thing here and it got overplayed for a while. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a local farmer here that uh, Turp Wizard processes for pretty mainly that I was uh, able to process a little bit for this year, uh, Lime Rising Farms, Nick. And uh, he bred this Bicket OG, which is GMO times cherry pie. Yeah. And that's still, uh, honestly, like, I would say a favorite. Um, the uh, um, And then just really lately, dude, Growfather, the guy that, you know, the farmer that I'm working with, dude, he's got a couple of his own uh, finds. So the Frost Donkey uh, was my entry into Ego Clash, which is uh, GMO peanut butter breath cross. Um being the rookie that I was, dude, I didn't even get my jar back. I don't even remember. I don't even know what my fucking entry number was because I didn't know I was supposed to go get my jar back. So I just left. I was so high. Like, we just left. I, like, I had no fucking clue. Everyone's like, dude, you didn't get your towel or your jar. I'm just like, well, fuck. Well, <laughs> I guess that's I guess that's late. So, um, so I don't even know where I stand or, like, who actually got to, you know, knows, you know, like, I don't know what was what there, but um it's just kind of kind of yeah man yeah that's yeah. uh that's wild i mean i re remember stumbling out of that uh the judges area and after yeah. 41 melt dabs it was it was hard to have a conversation with me that's for sure yes 100 percent, dude i couldn't even, i couldn't i couldn't barely think dude i have i haven't dabbed like that in years and uh it was really cool, you know, and I haven't done melt like that in years, um, let alone 40 high quality melt dabs. Like yeah, the, there the wasn't any melt. trash, yeah. not there wasn't a single fucking bad strain, dude. Like, yeah. you know, and like um, that was really cool. Like, you know, when you get 40 jars through your face of melt and, and you know, something that really shows that truth. And it's just like, yo, OK, like we've got some heaters in this room. That's really fucking awesome. So. Yeah, no, that was it was incredible. I uh, that I'll definitely never ever ever forget that experience. Yeah. Um, what uh, for people looking to you know follow or, or get involved or get to Ego Clash or become a hash maker, you know what what advice do you have? Is there anything that that you know you wished you learned earlier in your career, whether it be you know business advice or or advice in the lab like what, what would you pass on to to guys looking to follow in your footsteps um slow down accept the journey do the work don't cut corners read more um you you really got to try you know like you really got to believe in what you're doing and why you're doing it and you really got to like learn to read this resin um and uh you really just got to accept it. Like, like I said, man, you got to be here for the journey. Um, hash making is not something that just anybody can really do. Like, yes, the tech is shared. And once you get to like where some of us are, like it's easy because the tech is shared. But uh, a lot of these guys got to realize that there's serious fucking years of knowledge just about resin in general. Um, already, you know, background in, in these things before we even are starting this. So um, just enjoy the ride, man. Like, don't rush it. Don't listen to your friends. Buy the pack of seeds, even if they make fun of you. Fucking run the shit, you know, and just and just keep doing you and keep washing the shit. And one of these days you'll turn ahead and, you know, you hopefully that head will be fucking you know, somebody you look up to, like, you know, like was for me, like Brandon and Kaya, and then you'll end up at a fucking table with people that are like you, where you finally feel, you know, a serious, like sense of, of, of accomplishment and belonging. And, you know, that's, that's really cool. Like, um, I, I really wish that, you know, more people, um, could experience that. A hundred percent. I mean, I think we're on the road to it, but it, it's, <clears throat> it's so cool to, be in that room with that many people who are as passionate about the same thing that you're passionate about and, and understand the specialness of <laughs> the room that they're in. And uh, it yep. was very cool. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, in your, in your cannabis career, what would you say, you know, you've won a couple of cups, you attended many events. Uh, what stands out as, as, 
the thing that you're most proud of? I don't even know, man. Like getting that ego invite still to me seems like one of the biggest like holy shits. Um, you know, I, I, I've felt like a, you know, I felt like a nobody in this for a lot of years, even though like a lot of people here in Michigan consider me, you know, legacy and I get told, you know, I'm a legend and shit. And I just, I don't, I don't look at myself like that. I never have. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm doing this for the love of the plant and for myself and, uh, this plant saved my life. Obviously, you know, I come from some rough shit and this plant was always there for me, man, whether it was, you know, to help me with my medical shit or whether it was to put clothes on my back or gas in my tank or food in my mouth, like, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I just got a different love for that. So as far as like, you know, career accomplishments, like at this point, like I, I still feel like, even though I've been doing this for a long time, I'm, I'm really young in it. And, uh, I like that young feeling because that just means there's so much room for improvement and to meet, you know, more people like, you know, you and myself that are, you know, doing this, that have this love and, um, yeah, man, like that's really it. I just, I just want to keep going, you know, getting that ego invite and being able to go out there was just like a big refresh and it made me really see, you know, what I can do as a hash maker. And I've got, you know, 20 years of cultivation experience outside of this. So, to be able to get back to that and and be able to do that together like uh is is going to be really cool because uh like i said man i'm i'm fucking swinging lights out next year dude i'm stoked i i i know you're coming man i mean you, you're you're putting the energy out i'm putting the energy out for an invite myself so it's old brandon man this is full metal mullet <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, I, other than the people we've touched on, I know you've shouted out a couple of people. Um, any other people who've been really instrumental in your journey that, that you want to shout out? You know, this is kind of your chance to 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 give them their props. Um, yeah, man. Uh, all the fucking OGs. Um, you know, uh, Marcus, BC Bubble Man. Um, you know, thanks for this platform, you know, um, big thanks to you, man. Like we've chopped it up in the early days about dirt bikes and, and riding and shit like that. And outside of resin, and that was always real cool to me. Um, Kaya Pacific Northwest roots, man, that, that dude is always, I've always looked up to him as, you know, a mentor and, uh, learned a lot from him, even in even life stuff outside of, of cannabis, you know, um, and, uh, um, uh, just, uh, a lot of the original OGs, man, you know, I come from, you know, the, I was young in the era that I started in cannabis. And so even, you know, going back to guys like Jack Hare and, you know, some of this early like political history uh, around cannabis and, um, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a lot there. Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's really hard to just like, you know, like uh, space bond, like I mentioned him, like, uh, I've got a lot to be thankful to him for, uh, for where I'm at, you know, um, a lot, I can thank I can thank that guy a lot more for than anybody really. Um, because, you know, he's the reason I met guys like Kaya and, um, you know, all of them out there and, uh, I've gotten blessed. I've been, I've been in the right place at the right time with the right people. And, uh, I'm just trying to, you know, keep that momentum and energy and just, be the same thing to others that these guys are to me in the long run. Um, you know, and that, that's really it, man. Just that's it. You've got it, man. You've got, you've got the energy and I, I can see that. Like it's, it's super cool to see guys like you who are kind of like the next gen makers who are going to bring up the next crop of dudes and, and, you know, you've got the right attitude about it. So it's like, you know, I want to help, do whatever I can to promote that. And you clearly very grateful for those who, who have helped you. And, and that's very clear to see. So I, I, I commend you, man. I think that's really Thank great. You, man. Um, you know, you mentioned that you're getting married this year. You're yeah. building, you've, you've got your facility. You're going to be ready for swinging for single source. Uh, you know, is there anything else that you're super excited about either personally or professionally coming up for you this year? Um, 
Um, not really. I mean, yes and no, you know, uh, it's a lot of stuff. I'm not trying to discount it. Yo, like, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm finally, I'm finally, I'm finally in a, in a, I feel like I'm finally in an arena now. Um, I'm excited to join you guys at Moth here in January. Yeah. Um, I'm still working on logistics if I'm going to be able to like make it out to coffee and donuts or not in February. Uh, but they just announced smoking jacket for 23. And, uh, I think really at this point, my focus is going to be getting my farm built. Uh, having our wedding and then focusing on entries for smoking jacket and potentially ego clash. And I'm just going to really keep it short sighted at that for the year because uh, um, that's, that's really all I need to do, man. I don't, I don't not being at this farm now. I don't have a lot to worry about. I've, I've went, endured a lot of the harder work um, in, in my career and my life. And now I get to settle in and really just focus again um, I spent a lot of years building everyone else's situations. Um, I spent a year building Turp Wizards facility and, uh, I'm just looking forward to, to doing my own thing now, man. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm super stoked for you. We'll definitely be in touch. Um, oh, yeah. wh where's the best place for people to reach you if they, you know, they're watching this and they want to get in touch. Instagram at Organitron on Instagram. Um, follow me up, man. Um, I just, I try to keep it real. I try to talk to everybody and I just, you know, like, you know, be inspirational and, and, uh, keep it moving. I like, I like seeing, uh, the interest and, uh, I like seeing the younger generation and I'm really glad that I can like be here to help kind of guide that, you know, and, um, looking forward to kind of like solidifying my place as, you know, that OG and legend that I'm already being described as because, um, that I don't think that that comes without work and without, you know, privilege and without, you know, you know, strife. And, you know, I've been through a lot to get here. So I just want to be able to prove, you know, that none of those, you know, names are in vain and, and, and stuff like that. So follow me up Organitron Instagram. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here to share and, uh, yeah, yeah, man. Oh, well, Chase, we appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much. Hope everybody enjoyed. If you want to meet Chase, he's going to be in New York at Moth. Moth tickets are still on sale. There's still a few left. Come through. Come through, MountingTheHeads.com. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, and thank you, brother. Thanks for the show.